I'm giving away a free guided fishing trip on Deep Creek Lake Reservoir in Maryland with Fish Pimp Bass Fishing Guide Services. To enter the contest, all you have to do is become a Patreon member. The winner will be announced October 16th during that Monday Night Live. Again, all you have to do, sign up for my Patreon, link down below, and you're automatically entered for a chance to win a fishing trip. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons. And today we have a really special guest. We have on Will Nash. Uh, I actually met this guy through social media. We got talking back and forth and I was able to convince him to kind of come on the show today. Will, thank you so much. Absolutely. Glad to be here. So, I mean, what kind of got you into this crazy sport? Uh, you know, I, I grew up on an 800 acre beef cattle farm. We've got three ponds on the lake and then all the adjoining farms. We've got another seven farms. So my buddy GW and I just grew up riding foilers from pond to pond all day, every day when we weren't in school, just fishing. So it's kind of how I grew up hunting and fishing around, again, our family farm, local, other local farms. Uh, then kind of got out of it a little bit in my 20s and then kind of, you know, mid 30s, I got back into it. 2015, I bought my first little small Allison bass boat. It was nothing special, a little nineties model and started going down to Bugs Island. Uh, and that was like ran my head against the wall when I first started going down there fishing. But, you know, over time, just, you know, being persistent, I try to be a student of the sport, try to learn as much as I can, read as much literature, watch videos, talk to other people. Um, and then just been slowly chipping away at it since 2015. Um, so that's kind of what got me into it. But, you know, I try to be on the water at least one day a week. Uh, I've got my daughters every other weekend. Uh, they usually go home with their mother on Sundays around lunchtime. So I will jet off to the lake on Sundays. And then the weekends I don't have them. I'm trying to be out there at least one, you know, that, that Saturday if I can. And if I have a tournament that weekend, I try to fish the day before that Friday. Uh, my work can be you know, fairly flexible with me. I still have to take conference calls and stuff like that from the boat. Uh, but can get out there and fish. That's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> That's a great conference call. Yeah. 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 Sometimes I've, I've done video calls with guys out there before and actually caught fish while I was on video calls. So they get a kick out of that sometimes. <laughs> Dude. Okay. You're living the life. That's freaking awesome. Um, what kind of cattle farm did you grow up on? Was it dairy? Was it beef? It was dairy until the early nineties and my grandfather sold the dairy business and we transferred over to beef cattle. Uh, so it's soybeans, wheat, my uncle Twyman and my cousin Todd, they, they still farm that. So it's straw, wheat, soybeans, mostly. He got rid of most of the beef cattle, I guess, probably seven or eight years ago. Oh, dude, that's so much. That's so much work. My wife's mom actually grew up on a dairy farm. So that's absolutely insane. The amount of work that they had to do. Yeah. No concept of days off for vacation. Those cows have to be milked every day, whether you want to. Or not. Oof. So the tournament scene for you, like what really got you into that? Cause you say like, I want to get into fishing versus I want to kind of just start getting a taste of this, this tournament organization or, or just tournament fishing in general. What was that like? Yeah, I would consider, I would consider myself honestly a newbie to, to tournament fishing for the most part. Um, a local group of guys here, I'm from Appomattox County. So, you know, we've got a lot of guys that are into fishing in this area. We started getting together, you know, 10 to 15 boats for a few years. That's kind of how it started out. Just fun fishing, you know, $50, buck entry fee. Uh, and then a friend of ours, Tommy Campbell, that owns TNT Outfitters, they started sponsoring a little bit bigger trail. You know, it kind of, kind of matches the same format as Curl Lake Bassmasters. Uh, and that's a 25 boater um, that we have. And Tommy's, you know, gracious enough to try to work around my kid's schedule as much as he can. He can't line every single one of them up. So that's why I try to spend as much time as I can. They, they keep up with points. They have a points championship uh, and they have a two day classic at the end of the season. Uh, and I fished a, you know, a few Curl Lake Bass Smashers. I'm jumping in some cat trails starting next weekend. I want to try to do the fall schedule that luckily enough that I actually lined up every single tournament except one lines up for a weekend. I don't have my children. Um, so I'm going to try to fish all of those. My partner Austin and I are going to try to jump in all those, but you know, it, my oldest daughter is 16. My youngest is 11 as they start getting older and older, they have more of what they want to do in their own lives. So I'm going to try to be jumping into, you know, to more, to more tournaments, uh, you know, as I can. All right. Do you have any thoughts, aspirations of, of going the BFL route, the Toyota, the Bass Open route, or just, it, or the cats, something like that? 
you know, maybe the BFL, you know, last weekend we had our, our two day classic. I would have finished seventh in the BFL based off the weight I had in our tournament. Um, but that's definitely not a, a normality. Uh, there's a lot of good fishermen, a lot of better fishermen than me, obviously in that, in that, uh, that series, but yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to consider it for sure. It's something I would aspire to, but again, I'm just not going to sacrifice family time to try to, to try to go fish those. So, uh, and you know, the, the local group of guys we fish with, we we all grew up with each other, all know each other some way, shape or form. So it's all always fun to fish with them and kind of cut up with them, but Definitely, the, the more and more I get into it, the more and more I want to test what, what little skill I do have against some of the better anglers. So it's definitely something I would aspire to do for sure. Well, you know, as you said earlier, you would have finished right up in the top 10 from the BFL Super Tournament on Kerr that was last weekend. So, I mean, clearly yep. you can hang with some of those sticks. Um, really, really talk about weight-wise this year. The weights that we saw... Is that what we can consider normal for this time of year? Abnormal for this time of year for Kerr Reservoir? I think at least the last two months, the weights have been better. Uh, it, it's been right up there on, on par with what I've been seeing in the spring. I mean, yesterday in the, the Bass Nation, 18 pounds is leading right now. Um, I know last weekend we had you know 13 pound both days, but we were hooked up with fish. I think we could have had 15 or 16 uh, Alex Sayer, he won our he won our two day classic. I think he had sixteen pounds on the last day, but he was hooked in the fish that could have gave him nineteen. Um, so I I personally feel like the the lake is fishing really good. Again, I only have experience back to twenty fifteen, so I can't speak to really what was going on before then. But you know, we had some uh, we had some good bags in the spring. Um, you know that that twelve to fifteen pound range seems to be it, and then if you get on a really special bite, that fifteen to even twenty. Um, I think is definitely a possibility all year long, honestly. And then guys, just to make sure, just for people that are listening, uh, on, on Apple or Spotify. So, so Derek, uh, really cracked an amazing two day bag. So day one, it was 16 pounds, day two, 15, um, Brandon gray, 14 pounds, first day, 12 pounds, second day. So if you're really looking at it, if you catch, I mean, just like you said, averaging 12 pounds a day you're probably going to cash a check on this place. And, and to me, what's so interesting about this fishery and, it, and I like to like try to reference this with like the upper bay, upper bay, the top portion, top 10 are probably going to catch close to 20 pounds each. Then that thing plummets off and everyone blanks. It's just a lot of zeros. This place, it's like the high end is, is a little bit smaller. It's about 12 to 14 pounds, but it looks like almost damn near everyone's going to catch at least one. Like the, the amount of little fish yeah. in this place is insane to me. Oh yeah, you can. I, I think we probably caught over a hundred fish the last weekend. No kidding. Like all jokes aside, we're we're on a, a wolf pack a wolf pack schooling bite right now, and I mean it is just it can be every single cast. You want to talk about fun? That's fun. Um, definitely never have a problem catching numbers at Bugs Island. Um, you know, I, I did see some of the limits drop off in that BFL last weekend. Though I mean it 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 really fell off after the top fifteen or twenty. I think it was. But to your point, I think there were still, you know, ones, twos, three, you know, limit bags that were still coming in. So uh, it can be tough. Uh, you know, I'll be I'll be the first one to admit it right now without live scope. It, it's tough to get bit out there with with the bite that we're on. A lot of us are on. Um, what is a kicker? What size would a kicker be considered at Kerr in the fall? I think anything over four, uh, you know, Last last Friday we we tried we tried to do more looking than we did fishing, but I did stick a five, uh, it, in in practice, and then in that same spot, uh, the, again the guy Alex that won it he caught a he caught a four twenty two with ten minute ten or fifteen minutes to go on the last day, and I had a four seventeen, so he beat my big fish. So I'd say four plus is a is a good kicker on bugs. Um, but yesterday I heard a six and a half was waiting in and a five by the guy leading the the Bass Master uh, or the Bass Open, Bass Nation, whatever it's called. Um, so, I mean, those sixes and sevens are out there. It's it's rare you hear of eights, personally. Uh, I think I probably can count on one hand how many fish over eight pounds that I've personally heard of in the last few years, but they are out there. I mean, there was a nine that was caught up near the dam uh, four or five years ago. There was a ten and a half caught in Rudge Creek, I think, three years ago. I think the guy was... Carolina rigging a brush haul in the winter. Um, so they're there. It's just harder to come by. Why is that? I mean, why, why is it you don't see, why is there such a big drop off, you think? I, you know, I, 
that place gets the hell kicked out of it, man. I mean, it is tournaments every single weekend. I just don't know if the fish don't have time to recover. I don't know if it's a lot of fish that die after the, you know, they, they make it to weigh in, they make it through the weigh in, you turn them loose, they swim off. Uh, there may be some dying out there, but as, as big as that lake is, as healthy as as much shad and heron as that lake has in it, it's, it's hard for me to imagine why they don't, you know, why they don't get bigger than they do. I know there was a fish kill many years ago before I started fishing it. Um, but I mean, I, again, I, I see the lake coming back. Um, you know, it used to be go out there, you catch something over three pounds, you were doing something. It feels like you can get a three pounder, you know, just about every trip for the most part. Um, but when you start breaking that four to five and that five plus, that's when you, uh, I think I heard Tyler say it one time, that's when you live in right, right? Those are, mm-hmm. <laughs> those are hard to come by. Uh, for I sure. had Bryson on when he won the BFL and he said like, yeah, you're looking for those Kerr unicorns, which are those five plus founders. Yeah, that's right. They are, they are unicorns, but, but the unicorns, but you know, every, it seems like every year for the last three or four years, the amount of fours and fives that I personally catch in the numbers increasing every year. Mm. And I don't know if that's because I'm learning the lake better every year that goes by or they're getting better. Maybe it's a combination of both. Um, but, you know, you are seeing those, you know, 16 to 20 pound bags come in more regularly, I feel like. I, I think the lake is getting better. It's just, I guess it's because it started for such a low area. When you start at negative 10 and you get better, it just takes you longer to kind of get out of that trough. Um, and it's interesting you yeah. mentioned boat pressure because, yeah, everyone I have on just says boat pressure. And I don't know what you're going to do about that because unless you're willing to go to a different lake to give this place some pressure off, because I know the BFL schedule just dropped for the Shenandoah division. I think they go to the Potomac river twice uh, and they don't go to Kerr at all. So yeah, unless you give it a rest and go somewhere else, like there's, what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the recreational boat traffic, believe it or not, this is the worst year I've ever seen it on a lake. There were some days it looked like Smith mountain Lake out there. It was, it just blew my mind. I don't know how much, what that really does to it, but, I do know a lot of the big fish are out there in the middle, believe it or not, Roman. And I don't know what a lot of that recreational boat traffic does to them. It, it may be nothing. Again, not sure there, but um, I'm just excited. I think the striper population is getting better, too. Um, I'm seeing, you know, last year, I think I had five or six fish over 30. I know that's not big for Smith Mount Lake, but for Bugs Island, a 30 plus inch striper is a big striper. So it seems like a lot of the species are getting better, even the crappy. As I think probably crappy and striper is what Kerr is best known for probably uh, in terms of quality. And, you know, I've, I've had a bunch of really good crappy days out there, some solid striper days. So it seems like everything's improving. Uh, it would be cool if we could get a, some kind of stocking program going on like they've done at Smith Mountain and other places. I think that would be good, um, you know, or even managing some of the Virginia lakes like Texas does. I know that's probably a, a big leap, but uh, just putting some more money into some of the lakes, I think would really help. And if, if, Kerr is some, a, a stop that a lot of these tournament organizations want to go to. I think that would be a prime candidate uh, to make some, some monetary investment. Yeah, and I had the Army Corps of Engineers on, and if they would just get rid of or lax the zero hydrilla policy where they stock so many grass yeah. carp every year, good God, that would help a lot just to get a little bit of SAV yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah, that would. That would definitely help a lot. You're right. I mean, that just puts more oxygen in the water, gives more places for the bait fish to hide, the fish to hide. Uh, but you got to think the people that live on the lake, they don't want any of that stuff on the mm-hmm. lake. So that's, they probably have different stakeholders in that argument for sure. Yeah. That, that whole stakeholder thing gets annoying. It's like, aren't we the constituent face? We're the ones that pay the fishing licenses, but it, it's, I, I get it. It's more complicated than that. It's not as just black and white. Yeah. Yeah, sure. With that said, you, you mentioned something that, that is, it's come up a couple of times on Kerr. It's about these roaming fish that are just, they school or chasing blueback. Is that something that you see throughout the year or is it just this fall time that it really kicks into high gear? I only see it in the fall, usually into August. When you, Once you see a thermocline develop, like I'm out there all of July looking for that thermocline. And once that thermocline gets hard, it just, you start to see the bait fish push up to the top of the water and the bass are right behind them. Um, and it usually lasts, you know, the lake's turning over a little bit right now in certain sections of the lake. Uh, and it'll last beyond turnover. But once you start getting that October time frame, I think the bigger fish that are out there wolf pack and they move up shallow. And I think some of that may actually be happening now. I, I think there's probably a, a fairly decent shallow bite going on. I haven't checked it. I've, I've been so focused on that, that deep wolf pack bite right now. I just haven't 
haven't even gone up there. I just like going up there and sticking 50. And then if you can catch four or five that are three plus, that's, that's a hell of a day on bugs. There's going to be a lot of people listening to this show that are interested on how, and I believe I want to make sure I was correct. You don't have forward facing sonar in your boat, correct? No, I do. do? hundred percent okay. have. I, I, what I was saying was, I don't, I don't know how you go out there right now and, and get a, you know, can catch 50 fish with the way the fish are behaving without it. Personally, I'm, I'm sure there's some sticks out there that are doing it. So I don't, I'm not trying to take any away from that, but me personally, if you took that away from me right now, I wouldn't be catching the bags. I'm not ashamed to admit that. And, and that kind of leads to my next question. When you see a lot of bait, it can, can you have too much bait when you, when you look into the gut of a cove and it's just clouded, is that kind of what you're looking for? Generically speaking, will you fish that? And then honestly, how long do you give? Do you give two hours on a group or is it just one or two casts and then bang out if you're not getting hit? one or two casts and it's more of an area thing I, you know obviously the bait has to be there for the fish to want to relate to that area but you know it could be a 500 by 500 stretch oh, wow. out in nothing that the fish are just roaming and you're just you're just out there using your your live scope like a flashlight in the water and you're looking for those wolf packs and a lot of times those wolf packs are going to be in the upper part of the water column so you can see them um and I'll, I'll rotate three or four baits through. And if I just feel like they're not biting, I'll maybe go to air, but I'll come back. It's a lot of times it's a timing thing too. I may hit the same spot six, seven times in a day. Mm. Um, if, it, if it's like a brush pile or a cane pile and you throw up there and you, you get one or two off of, you, you just need to leave and just let them set back up, give them at least 30 minutes. But I may cycle the same brush or cane pile, like I said, six or seven times in a day. And I'll catch fish every, every time you pull up, but it's usually that first, the first cast is the money shot. You want to make that one count. I, I was blessed in college, my fish college tournaments. I got to go down and fish Lake Murray, Lake Hartwell, Lake Kiwi a lot. The pinnacle of blueback lakes besides maybe Lanier. And the more, yeah. the more I look at Kerr, the more it sounds like it's starting to set up more and more like those places where it's just, you, you mark a bunch of cane or brush piles and you're hauling ass from point to point to point or area to area, just waiting for the right ones to turn on when the blueback show up. Is it, is it blueback generically? You think that they're chasing right now? Or is it shad too? Yes. I think they're chasing shad too. But if if you can, you know, if you pull up and you see that long, tall, vertical column of blueback herring, um, it's usually some bigs roaming around that. I think that's what the, I think that's what those three to five plus pound fish prefer mm. uh, are those bluebacks. But that's not to say I haven't seen them on just thread fin and, you know, L wise. I don't know that I can, I'm not an expert enough to tell the difference between a, a blueback and a, and a LY, but I know they're both in, in Kerr. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I, I think the big ones prefer the bluebacks if you can find that. Yeah. It, it's completely different as this thing slowly steps up to, to more of a, more of a, a blueback only lake. And I think if the water would stay a little bit cleaner to give those blueback a little bit more of a range and they get built more like the ones down South. Cause the ones guys at Lake Murray and Lake Harwell, they're massive. I mean, dude, they're, they are long ass suckers and you could tell why the <laughs> spots there get so fat when you're get to down that kind of forage. Yeah. Um, yeah. You talk about the wolf packs though. Are, are there any shallow wolf packs and is that even ever strategized yeah. into a tournament uh, situation? Yeah, June, uh, usually June. It, so the, all the, the wolf packs really wolf pack up after the spawn, I feel like, and they're roaming shallow. You can catch them in 10 foot or less. So what, what I'm out there seeing now and, you know, way, way deeper water, you see shallow in that June time frame, and then they just slowly migrate out deep. Mm. So, you know, go through there, throw in a walking bait or cane walk or a pop or things like that just to cover water. Buzz baits are good. Um, they may still be out on main lake points in the June time frame, but they're just way, way shallower. But a lot of times they're in that first one third, maybe two thirds of main lake pockets. Um, you know, last year, a friend Todd got on a, a really good wolf pack bite. He was catching, you know, 50, 60 a day, but he was catching some bigs too doing that. Uh, again, just throwing top water lures. That's insane. But you'll see, you can see them up there shallow. It, like I, I found the heron didn't spawn that good this year that I saw. I did find one one magic day at a point close to the dam or near the dam rather, uh, where the heron were spawning. You could actually see these big shadows of big bass wolf pack that look like about the size of a car hood, and they're just roaming up their shallow That's through. So freaking cool! Yeah, with it, yeah, within fifteen minutes, I had fifteen or sixteen pounds. I got real healthy real fast. So, dude, uh, again, that was back. In that was back in the June time frame. Um, so they, they do that. And then I think they just slowly slip out deep. 
uh, as that thermocline gets higher in the water and pushes the bait up and the bait pull out after this, their spawn's over with and they pull out deep, they just follow them. Dude, that is, is what really, I feel like. Ah, oh, that's so much fun. That sounds like a blast. Yeah, that was a, that was a, a crazy, crazy day. And it was in the middle of the day. It was like 12 o'clock in the middle of the day. I actually just pulled up and I just saw all these shad flickering and spawning. Looked down in the water, I'm like, man, these are herring. And then I just start seeing these big shadows of fish kind of swimming and throw them. Uh, it was definitely one of those one of those days you dream about for sure. Freaking cool. And then just kind of segueing back to the fall bite then, how do you generic in general, did you practice for some of these events? When, you, when it's like here today, gone tomorrow, they're always moving. That's got to make practice a lot more frustrating uh, than if it was like a shallow pre-spawn, spawn type of deal. The frustrating part is going out there and looking and not being able to stick to things, man. Like that's, that's my, it, all my buddies give me a hard time because, you know, I went, I went practice all the time. I'll, you know, catch threes and fours the day before and then, you know, come practice or come tournament day, it, it just doesn't replicate itself. So for me, it's just looking at not being able to catch them is the most frustrating thing. But right now my, my approach is I'm trying to hit 50 to 75 spots and I may never even cast on those spots. Sometimes I do want to catch one to check the quality there, but a lot of times you can you can kind of guess what the quality is by what you're seeing on the screen. Uh, you know what a three pound fish looks like versus a one pound fish. Uh, and then usually those those big wolf packs, they show up as fuzzier, bigger balls. Some of them get so big, you start not to be able to tell the difference between them and striper, except for the way they're set up. Usually the bigger fish like to be in smaller wolf packs, four to six, sometimes, a big single you see a lot of big singles the big singles that show up as a fuzzy ball those are the ones you want but they don't have any competition so they're really a lot harder to get to entice into a bite the more fish the more competition the more opportunity you're going to have to stick those fish um so I, I generally like to see three or more um to create some competition two will do it sometimes but a lot of times you'll see those two they'll just will fall in line behind each other and follow your bait in a perfect world um, you're finding these fish uh, relating to something, a cane pile or a brush pile, it's not that you're just out in the middle of the lake with your trolling motor, just looking around, hoping to hell that you hit pay dirt. No, it's both. It's, it's, I, I feel like right now the bigger fish are out there on nothing. It's, it's more of a, you have to look at the lake at a, at a macro level. Uh, meaning like you may look at a Creek arm and see a channel swing or a main lake point, but you have to bring us, bring it up 10,000 foot and say, what is the, the overall, mm -hmm flow of the lake doing and then you'll find areas that it's nothing out there i mean you want to scan through there to make sure there's bait there obviously that's why they're out there um but it may be relating to a point but they're just way off the point um I, you know i think some of them you they're out there in the middle but I, I, there's a lot of fish close to brush piles too i mean i'm not saying i'm not cycling through brush piles and king piles because i absolutely am just feels like the the better quality fish may be out there deeper so if you marked a fish on a Friday in the middle of nowhere on this saddle. Are you just dropping? Are you just setting down right on the waypoint and start casting? Or are you going to idle through there to check to see if there's bait before you, you even make a cast? No. If I know the fish there, I won't idle where there's fish. I'll just go up to the front and start again, flashlight through the water, seeing what I'm seeing. But a lot of times that's why I try to go the day before. If you find them in that area, they're generally going to be there. I'm not and if they're not like last weekend, I had, three rock piles that are probably 50 or 60 yards apart. Um, I thought they were secret until the, the NFL came there and there was boat cycling off of it all day. So there's, there's nothing secret on that damn lake. Um, but what I found was there was one of those points and I'm telling you, it was probably 50 or hundred spots. I think I caught three or four citation spots off that one area. Crap. Uh, you know, the, yeah, the week, that, there were some four and a half pound spots. My buddy Todd McCormick caught a four fifty eight or four eighty five spot last week, and I know a three Alex uh, Sari caught another four plus pound spot. So there's four pound spots coming out of that lake right now. Um, but anyways, those fish they had moved down to the third rock pile. So it's it's they just they just switched the point that they were on because they were getting so much pressure on that one. So even if they move the day before look around and say hey what's within two or three hundred yards of this that they may go step back on the phone because of pressure or because they followed some bait uh and that's how you can kind of find them in practice you you said you're hitting close to 60 spots a, a day is that the same strategy you're using tournament day or are you just camping in areas or does it just depend no i'm i'm nearing that 60 down to 40 to 50. your fuel is really what i'm doing God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's usually it's usually pull up, it's pull up, do a few casts, and then and then run. Um, 
Yeah, it, that's 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 generally what what I'm trying to do this time of year now. You know, springtime um, or even like post spawn, I'll, I'll I'll milk an area a little bit more uh, during that time. But right now, they're just they're all moving so much that you're just you're trying to run and gun as much as you can. You feel it at the end of the day, man. Let me tell you. I don't think people truly appreciate, especially the river rats, the people that live on the James River, Rappahannock, Potomac, Upper Bay. They don't understand culturally what you have to do to be successful in these blueback herring lakes, where it is 50 to 60 spots. Whereas if you're on the Potomac, you might be anchored in Madawoman for eight hours and never move. Like it's completely yeah. foreign to people that aren't used to that. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not saying camping out in a spot isn't a winning strategy. Um, I'm sure there's some that are doing it and doing just fine with it. It's just for me personally right now, it's, I'm trying to run and gun and covers, you know, I, I may cover two thirds of that lake, you know, the, after you find out where everything's at the, you know, the practice, you try to come back, go back and try to map out, a, you know, a route, a big loop essentially. And then based off that loop, you know, you might pull up to a spot and catch a nice three pound fish and it has some with it. Well, I'm going to go down the lake a little bit. I want to loop back to hit that again before I go too far down the lake, or I'll try to cycle through it on the way back through on my, on the backside of that loop. But, um, yeah, you're really the Friday before I'm just trying to narrow down the spots that are holding the better fish to, you know, to maximize my opportunities. Did everything go according to plan, uh, your tournament last weekend? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of, they, they never, I mean, they do and don't the, the pressure, the pressure changed what the fish were eating a little bit. Um, we caught them good the first day, how we wanted to and how we were catching them in practice and how I've been catching them weeks leading up to that. But on the second day, the weather conditions changed a lot of, you know, a low pressure front came through, a lot of storms came through. And uh, my partner, Austin, he actually figured out something that they were eating. I don't want to say it now just because they're, they're still chewing on that. But he, he said, I bet they would eat x bait he tried that first cast boom they hit it we retied everything and that's all we threw the rest of the day uh was it a moving bait that one or bait? just a bottom bumping bait it's no it's it's up in the water up column the water, okay. it's not a top water though. gotcha gotcha yeah. okay yeah yeah a lot of this i'm not doing anything i i can't do anything with the bottom bait right now really um i i know i know some folks that are out there you know that are fishing shaky heads and the, the bottom bait seemed to drop off a few weeks back for me personally. It was just frustrating the hell out of me. I, I still have one on my deck just to keep it honest because you just never know. Um, but leading into the practice where I was catching some of those citation spots, I tried throwing a jig, tried throwing a, a shaky head, a, hmm. a big ribbon tail on the swing, something to try to generate a bigger bite. And I just couldn't. It just felt like really the best way to get a bigger bite is to cover as much water as you can and cycle through as many fish. Um, Sometimes you can use a strategy to pull some of the smaller fish off a spot, which will leave the bigger fish back. And then your partner can come in behind you and try to catch that big fish. Um, that works because a lot of times the bigger fish, they're just not going to feed because there's so many smaller fish getting your bait first. So you try to move those fish if you can. And I think it's interesting to the strategy because if you're doing a bottom bumping bait, it's going to be a lot harder to hit 50 to 60 spots in a day. It just, it just is. You're a little bit yeah. slower. So what you're saying is both of you are using a moving bait, which kind of mm -hmm. makes sense why you're able to hit so many spots within a day um, without having to settle down and Correct. just soak something. Moving bait, targeting the top 10 foot of the water column. Does does the whole lake fire at the same time, or is that why it gets crowded? Is because it's usually I, I don't it's the bottom part in the fall, and then that's why because you have seven thousand boats there in there, and then it's the upper portion near grassy, or is it basically the the lake does fish big and it does spread people out? I think the lake fishes big and spreads people out, but that said, I think the biggest concentration of three to five pound bass right now, or you know that 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 upper end, you know, from like Rudge Creek up to the dam and in the nut bush. I think that's where all your, your bigger fish are right now. I'm getting ready to go to the lake today after we're done with this. And I am going to check some stuff down low just because I feel like there's so many people figuring out that wolf pack bite. There's so many people figuring out that, um, that section of the lake that's holding those better quality fish. I'd, I'd like to find some fresh fish, but I don't know that the areas I'm going to, cause I don't think that that school and wolf pack bite happens all over the lake. I do think it's a certain section of, again, in my limited experience, um, that's what's happening, but I am going to go check some different areas today just cause I do want to find some fresh fish if I can, but if I can't, I have no problem falling up into the crowd and fishing behind people. Uh, I think there's some things that 
my partner and I do a little bit different that gets us some bites where, or use some different baits or, you know, you know, off the beaten path type baits that, that get us bit or, or how we, how we present the baits too. I think, uh, there's some things that we do a little bit different. It definitely seems like nut bush is so interesting. And even talking to biologists and stuff, that seems where there's the highest concentration of blueback and bait is nut bush, the dam, that kind of area there. And then, but people yep. also roll their eyes about fishing nut bush because there's too much pressure. And I think it was Charlie Taylor, who's just an old dog in the area who talked about like, well, you understand like Nutbush is still bigger than Lake Anna. I mean, it's still a big damn area to, to have. And Nutbush is huge. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, you know, being completely honest, Nutbush is the part of the creek. And this is probably ass backwards, but it's the, the one I know the least about. Now, I've got a ton of waypoints there. I just don't fish. I really like grassy in the spring. I like the Clarksville area in the spring. Uh, I do like up towards like Eastland and North Bend area in the early, early spring, like February time frame. Uh, that's not to say I haven't fished Nutbush a lot this year and caught fish in it. I would just say that there's other parts of the lake that draw me there. And I, and I, I know probably all the, you know, the sticks on the lake and that area, or they know it way better than I do. Um, I just, I don't know it as well as a lot of the other guys do. So I don't spend as much time up there, but that's not to say I don't have a few holes in there either. What about it makes you want to stay away from it? Is it the pressure this time of year? Is it just karma? Is it something else? Uh, I don't, you know, honestly, when you ride down, I don't like the way it looks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I it, my, my buddies and I joke about, you know, it, and again, this is probably just my inexperience that, uh, I always believe you can look out at the land and whatever's happening on the land is happening underwater too. You can just follow it out into the lake. Yeah. Um, I don't like the way it always sets up. There's some areas that just seem boring. Uh, just, you know, but again, I know that's where probably the majority of the tournaments are one out of, you know, honestly. So it's, it's, it's a nut that I need to, to crack. Like I said, I'm not saying I, I don't have holes in there that hold fish. It's just, uh, I would probably say I only spend 30% of my time in there where I spend the rest of my time in other sections of the lake, depending on the year. Gotcha. Gotcha. You know, I mean, cause it's such a big lake and, and the idea, like to be able to graph this whole thing would take a lifetime. I mean, it's the amount of time it would take. Cause this place is massive. It's so insane. Yeah. Yeah. I've not yet grafted. I'd say I've grafted a lot of nut bush, like all of grassy, all the ruds, all the panhandle, all of Clarksville. All the Ivy Hills, Mills, Carter, all of that long grass. I've graphed all that. Everything up at the dam, I've graphed. Um, but I would say to, to complete it off to where I say I've covered all the shoreline from, you know, 30 foot up to the bank. I, I, I still have to finish off nut bush. This time of year in general, it, is it about like, like you said, and we're not going to give it away in the show, a special bait or is it a special area or both? I think it's a it's a special area and it's a combination of a few special baits. Gotcha, is is what I would say. And I, you know, it's also in the way that you present it. Um, and I'll just say that there's there's a way that you can present it where if you have a a buddy that can get you more bites, or you both are working together to present baits to the same group of fish. And the reason I say that is if you look at like the Potomac River. There's no special bait, generally speaking. Every now a guy will win on a glide. It's a Senko, but it's the area. If you're not on the right size yeah. fish, it doesn't it doesn't matter. You know, if they're all two pounders, you're just going to catch two pounders. About finding the right grass, the right hard cover, um, and then we're all throwing basically the same thing. So that's taught me it's yeah. like it's the area. You've got to be around the right caliber of fish. Now, curve well, and some I, yeah. I think that that's applicable. I think it's the area too, but once you find the area holding fish, uh, I do think you have to convince them to bite and that place does get a lot of pressure. I do think that bugs is a pattern late. Um, once you figure out a pattern, I have seen where, you know, um, there was a, a certain pattern I got on right after the, the spawn this year to where I was able to replicate that thing all the way from the mouth of Bluestone all the way up to Abbey Hill. Um, so once I figured it out, I went through finding those areas, marking it one day before practice. And then again, Austin and I, we just ran that and it was literally every single spot we pulled up to that set up that way. It was a fish every single time. Um, so I do think you can replicate a pattern big time over the lake as well. Um, but it, it's all about finding those areas, holding bigger fish. And because we've got herring now, they just moves them a lot. So, it, you know, again, I don't think there's any secret, truly secret holes. I'm sure there's a few, um, 
but it's really just making sure that you find the the whole hole in the right quality fish at the right time of the year. During your two day classic, um, you ended up getting second place. Walk yep. through that day. When did you think you had it, or was there, like you said, a special adjustment you made between day one and day two that really you thought the decision made it? Uh, we, you know, the during practice we were feeling really confident because we we knew we had a bunch of areas holding good fish, and I think we came in the the first day with almost thirteen pounds. I think we lost. You know, we fished clean most of the weekend. I think we lost fish that may have put us into the fourteen pound range, and then um you know alex there he's a he's a younger guy but he's a man he's a stick he's in fourth right now in the uh the bass nation event uh he came in that day i think he had a, a he had two tenths of a pound more than we did so it was really close that first day um yeah um and again it was just that wolf pack bite. Right? we were just trying to cover as many spots as we could in the mid mid to upper section of the lake uh, felt really good after the first day. What, what I told Austin was, you know, Hey, we didn't lose it the first day. That's all you can really hope for. We're still in contention to, to win it. And then on the second day, right up until that, right up until that last, uh, that last 30 minutes, man, I think we were damn near tied almost, but, um, Alex had pulled up to a spot that, uh, I actually caught that five pounder on the, the Friday before, and it was holding good fish. Um, it, it's a spot that we both know about, um, and it's a midday bite. So I, I was trying to save it for the last 45 minutes. And uh, he pulled up and caught that 422. And I think he called again. So that just took him from that 13 pounds to 16 pounds in that last 30 minutes. But like I said, he he can just flat out catch him, man. He's out there again doing it today. I hope he does well today. Uh, it's going to be hard to come back from, I think he's got uh, close to 15 pounds and the leader had 18. So he's got a, a little bit of a fight today ahead of him, but you know he can get it done insane well what temperatures are you looking for going into november because i know this place also has another portion where it gets on fire when you get closer to that november time frame it gets a little bit cooler when what temperatures yeah. are you generically looking for water temp wise that's a loaded question for me because my brain has striper on the right <laughs> now. Uh, I, I really 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 like i love bass fishing don't get me wrong but what really makes me tick man is that striper fishing and the striper fishing, it's almost like that fall wolf pack bite. They do that false run. Uh, once that water temps start getting into the, the 60s. Um, so anyways, for the bass, you know, I'm looking for that water temp to get into the 60s and start bringing those, those that bait shallow and the, the bass are going to follow. Because again, like I told you, there's no shame in admitting I'm catching them forward pace sonar, but that's not how I like to catch them. I like beating the bank, man. I like flipping targets. I like throwing spinner baits, moving baits, crank baits, catching them. So that's that's how I prefer to catch them. But um, I'm really looking for that. You know, once it starts dipping down into low 70s and the 60s, um, I'm hoping that's going to do a, a mass push shallow. I mean, it's already now. I think the last time I was in it was 82, 83. So it may be in the 70s now. Honestly, um, you know, after the cold cold week that we've had, I'll find out here in a couple hours. But yeah, that's what I'm looking for. I, so we're going to fish those the cat trails this year. But I told my, my partner also, I want to fish them up to the point where those stripers start going good. And then I'm probably just going to take all the bass gear out of my boat and I'm going to have nothing but uh, my striper gear in it. Let, yeah, let, let, let's let's pivot and talk about that. When does the striper bite really get good? Is it that 60 degree weather too? Yeah, I mean, it's happening now, honestly. Oh, wow. um, I, you know, I think I could go out there now if I really went out there and target them and catch, you know, 10 to 20 a day. Uh, they're on there in the long points and they're in big schools. They're just deeper. Uh, last weekend when the hurricane came through, they were surfacing. We saw two or three acres of the lake that looked like dynamite going off in it Dude, for 10 minutes. That looks like fun. Oh. Uh, and it was funny. We were we were up near Eastland and Austin had casted his line and it was lightning terrible. His line just hovered in the air for like two minutes. <laughs> and we look at each other and like, yeah, it's probably time to go. <laughs> well, we're going back to the boat ramp and all of a sudden you see this acre of the lake just blowing up. Mm. And Austin said, stop, 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 stop. So we slowed down. And he said, please, God, don't let me die. But we had to stop and catch some, <laughs> catch some of those stripers. And I think we caught five or six right there. And they were in the, you know, 26 to 27. I mean, they were healthy stripers for, for Kerr. So, I mean, my point is it's happening now. I think you can go out early in the morning and evenings and people are catching them on top water. They're surfacing. Um, mm. But when it, when it really gets good, it's usually that second, third week of October. And then November, I always take the week of Thanksgiving off from work, and I try to go every single day. And I try to take people who've never gone before, 
um, gone, you know, gone uh, striper fishing. I, I did a lot of that this past year, man. And there's some people who just ate up with it. Now I'm getting requests like, Hey man, can we go again this year? And I'm like, I I'm going to try to get you in, but I've got limited time. And then I take the, the last two weeks of uh, the year off. I try to save my vacation for that. Uh, and I'll go every day then. Is too. that good? And then it's that good. Go ahead. Is it that good? Yeah, it's that good. Wow. It's, I mean, it's, their day like we had i had a few days last year we were catching 40 to 50 stripers in a day and this is all artificial bait this isn't this isn't no live bait i don't fish with live bait at all wow um i mean it's it's to the point where my hands were so raw from handling the fish that you know that it, it hurt like your thumbs were bleeding and cracked and you're trying to wear gloves the best you can um but yeah, those are those are the days i, I like it too because all the the wake boats the recreational They're boats gone. are off the lake yeah. They're gone. I'm out there. You may see five or 10 boats a day. Um, my buddy T Moore and I, he, he goes a lot. So we share information. He's, he's actually bit by the striper bug more than I am. He's out there as, as much as he can every day fishing. So he, he stays up with them. And the other thing too, is they're, they're so migratory. You, you really do have to keep up with them. If you're out there every day, you can kind of follow those big schools and st stay up mm. with them. Um, so the more days you're out there in sequence, the easier it is to, to catch those fish. But last year they grouped up in the Clarksville area for about a month. Wow! And I mean, you could go out there and throw a naked hook and catch stripers. It was it was it was crazy uh, how many stripers were in that from Goat Island to the mouth of Bluestone area. I mean, it, they were just everywhere on every point out in the middle, just literally everywhere. Uh, that that last year, it's the first time I'd ever seen that. That's so freaking cool, dude! Like, so you said you take all your bass gear out of the boat. What what what's the adjustments really tackle wise that you make when you're targeting stripers? <laughs> Usually with uh, stripers, I'm only throwing uh, a, a rigs and flukes, sometimes jerk baits and a rattle trap. Those are the four baits I'll generally cycle through. Um, so if I can narrow it down and only have a couple rods on deck, that's what I want to do. Um, so I, I just take a lot of the gear out of the boat just to keep the boat light. I don't have to cycle through a bunch of stuff. Um, and then once the once it you know, it, the, the winter goes on, those fish start to get finicky and they want a smaller profile bait. And then I'm actually catching them on spinning rods with six pound leader. Damn, uh, that's I'm finessing them. Yeah. The, the only thing I don't like about that is every time you catch one, you got to fight the damn thing for 15 or 20 minutes. So your, your numbers go down, but I'll tell you what, it's never more exciting than catching a 30 plus inch striper on 12 pound braid running to a six pound leader. Holy crap. That's a hell of a, that's a hell of a fight. That's a yeah. hell of a fight, man. What, what's your personal PR? Yeah. Right now, it's actually this this one back here that came off buzz. That one was thirty two inches. Oh my gosh! I took my uh, I took my buddy Tom and his son last year, and what we were doing was we were making the cast for his son Isaac, and then handing him the rod and letting him reel it in so he could feel the bite. And he hooked up one that was almost thirty four, almost seventeen pounds. I mean, it was the head on the striper. Again, it, I know those Smith Mountain Lake guys are like, "Hey, thirty four inches is nothing," but we're proud of that thirty four inch striper <laughs> down at Curl Lake. Um, uh, he caught that man. I was so tickled to death to see him catch it. And his, you know, his dad was super excited. That's the biggest one I've ever voted. Um, but I really do believe in the next five years, you're going to start to see citation stripers. Not that one can't come out of there now. I just think you're going to see more of them in the next five years, especially since they put that limit. You can't keep them over 26 inches. I really, I know that a lot of the guys that go grocery shopping for them probably don't like that, but you know, I do keep some, my uncle's got alpha gal. So he loves it when I fill his freezer. He's always on my he's on my back right now, but his freezer's empty. He needs some stripers. Um, but I'm glad they put that that limit in place because I think that's going to help it turn into a, a more of a trophy uh, striper fishery. What adjustments are you making? Are you throwing like a uh, like a heavy action seven and a half foot flipping stick or just an umbrella rig rod basically with with braid? I throw a loose seven eleven super duty. Um, it's extra heavy. I've got. I, I've got Heavy, extra heavy, extra, extra heavy, depending on the, the type of A-rig I throw. I throw some haul collar, the, the bigger ones um, that, you know, have, you know, 10 plus blades on it. And then I'll go to, all the way down to a bladeless finesse rig. It's just, you can start to tell how the fish are reacting to the bait, to what you need to adjust to. Um, so I keep all three and I throw those on a loose Super Duty 300 reel. The bigger spool reels, I'm throwing on 25 pound uh, Sunline shooter. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I throw those on. Uh, and I like, I, I flip a lot of the fish too, just cause it, you can get them in and get them all faster versus if you net them, you got to undo all the damn hooks from all the, you know, the holes in the net. So I want a stiffer rod to swing them. 
smart. That's actually really smart. Um, so that's what I'm throwing that with. It's funny because when we mentioned striper, I remember when, it, when I started to go down and start fishing like Murray for the first time down in South Carolina, I had an old an, an old guy down there tell me like, always set your drag. Because back then we were throwing these like Sebelas. I don't even know if Sebelas are still around, these swim baits. And they were expensive for a college guy. And so he said, always set your drag because it could be a large mouth or it could be an absolute tank of a striper. And it took me a while to learn that lesson from my bass tackle that you probably, if you're out there on those schools, you should set your drag a little bit so you don't just lose baits on the run. <laughs> so it's a yeah. little tip there for everyone listening. You know, I, honestly, I've got my drag tight down as far. I want, I want to swing them and I want to stick them and I want to get them to the boat as quickly as I can. Now I say that. In the tournament last weekend, I stuck one one stripe. I know it had to been over thirty inches. It actually bent my entire hook Holy out. Holy God! <sighs> yeah, and it was not. And I had the drag tightened all the way down, and it was stripping drag. Um, yeah, so it sometimes that that's not the right approach. So I would definitely listen to your friend and say, "Hey, probably having your drag <laughs> set's probably the the right way to go." Uh, I just didn't thumb it. I, I thought I could power through it, uh, and I just put too much pressure on that that single that single hook, and it. I mean, it literally bent it straight out. I thought it broke when I was reeling it in. I'm like, I still feel something. I'm like, I can't believe it. That's the first time I'd ever seen that. Happen. That's a massive. Uh, fish. I just wish I could have landed that fish. Yeah, that's a massive fish. That's a big one. Uh, do, do you ever catch bass it, like in the winter time when you're going for striper? Do they mix at all in the winter time? Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. Yeah, and usually if you catch a bass with their striper, it's going to be a good one. It's going to be over three pounds. Holy God! Wow. Yeah. We, you know, there was uh, some friends of mine who got in some schooling stripers um, last week, and they caught some three and fours schooling with the stripers. Um, so it does happen. I don't like to do that because you got to cycle through so many daggone stripers to get it. But, you know, last year, we, um, my, my partner Austin and I were on the schooling bite, and we pulled up to a, a, a flat that drops out into a main channel, and it was covered in stripers. And we were bored um, we were because we've been looking at fish all day. We wanted to stick some. So we started throwing our lures and we started catching bass in with the stripers. Uh, again, I just, I don't think that's a, a strategy that necessarily you can count on paying off because it's so hit or miss. And then you lose so much time cycling through getting those stripers when they get in the boat, you know, they flop all over the damn place and they're hard to get hooks out of. And especially if you're throwing treble hook baits, they can get in you real fast too. I've had that happen. That's not a good, di- not a good time. Um, but yeah, the, the, the bass do mix in with them, but they're going to be a three plus pound bass in my experience. Well, I I can't thank you enough for coming on right now and just kind of giving everyone a lay of the lake uh, as we go into a, really a prime fall bite. And hopefully it sounds like a great striper fishery that I really didn't even know about. Um, I always knew about the Smith and the Lake Anna, but never like how good Kerr is. So, yeah, thank you for that tidbit of information. Yeah, I've got a bunch of striper videos on, on my I, I do YouTube videos more of so like a, a a digital memory and a digital legacy type thing, but I've got a bunch of striper videos that you should check them out. If you ever want to go, man, I'd love to get you on the boat and go. I promise you, you'll leave that day with a giant grin on your face. It is a ton of fun. If you just like swinging on five to 10 plus pound fish that happen to be in the bass family, it, it is a good, good time, man. I mean, you're, it's an action packed thing. You catch fish from the time we put in to the time we leave. It's a lot of no, fun. I uh, dude, I, I might have to I'm gonna have to hit you up on that. Um is there any sponsors or anyone that we can give a shout out to as well? No, I don't have any sponsors. I you know, I did want to give a shout out to T- Tommy at TNT Outfitters. He puts on uh our tournament series. Um, you know, he, he does a lot of hard work. I know it's a thankless job to do that. He does obviously doesn't make anything off it, but I just say I appreciate that. And then Brandon Curtis at Southside Southern Boat Works, he's my boat mechanic. Uh, Brandon makes sure I stay on the water. Uh, he's a bass fisherman. He's a serious bass fisherman, so he knows what the you know what the latest technologies, the products are. Knows how to install them. If I ever have an issue, Brandon gets me in and out really fast, and he's just a great mechanic. So I like to give them both a shout out. But again, they're not sponsored. I don't have any sponsors. Again, I'm just more of a weekend warrior and a student of fishing, man. Well, I, I think you have really great things to be coming in the near future. Um, I mean, starting in 2015 to where you're just basically always battling it out at, at Kerr, which is a very hard place to fish. So, yeah, I, I see really great things coming in your future. Guys, again, please like and subscribe to everything that we've been talking about today. Link in the episode description. And then if you'd like to, please, you know, try to follow me on Patreon. Uh, you guys are the reason that this whole show actually works now. Patreon supporter of the week is Bob King. Bob, thank you so much for all your work. Link in the episode description, everything we talked about, and we will see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.